Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 602 of the podcast and it is Friday the 4th of February 2022 as I record this. On today's show I'm talking to John Kramer about long-term book marketing strategies. Now John's 1001 Ways to Market Your Book was the first marketing book I ever bought Uh, so probably would have been early 2008 (laughs) before I got into any of this and I used to listen to his audio programs as they were called back then before podcasting really began and I would download his mp3s and listen to him talk about marketing (laughs) so it was really fun to connect and talk about ideas and what's changed and what hasn't changed because I really did start my author career by buying his book and of course he's rewritten it a number of times since then but the principles still remain which is is good. This is also an episode about attitude and the importance of time in the market. As John says our goal is to stay out there long enough that the people that need you or want you or hope to find you actually do find you. <laughs> It's funny, we get bored with our own stuff much earlier than other people do, as in most people have only just started finding us. Maybe this is even the first time you ever listened to this episode and it is, um, or this podcast, and it's episode 602. So it's interesting to reflect that as authors, we're often in a hurry to sell that first book and make an impact and grow our email list and and make that money. And a a lot of this, I think, is to do with the publishing industry's obsession with debuts. Uh, But that's not really the reality of a long term author career. And most of us, most of the best selling and best loved authors, those who are, you know, people name brands, I guess, have written a lot of books. So yeah, you can build slowly for years and readers will find you. So that's all coming up in the interview section. So in publishing and book marketing news and useful stuff, David Gochran just posted his best book promotion sites for 2022, which is a really good list. And it's also got loads of other things in about marketing, explanations about how to use promo stacking, which free sites and discount sites are worth using, how to do series promotions, list builders and more. It is an excellent resource, which I have bookmarked to go through. (laughs) In Writing Craft, check out the interview with Dean Kunst on Writers Inc. podcast. It is such an encouraging show because, you know, you think about authors like Dean Kuntz and Stephen King. and You know, we just think, oh, they must have been successful forever. But Dean talks about it taking 15 years from going full time as a writer to a bestseller. So I have personally now been writing for 15 years, although I didn't start fiction until 2009, I started writing fiction. Um, But I didn't go full time until 2011. So that gives me 2026. According to Dean's timeline, when I could, you know, hope to potentially do better with my fiction. Uh, And of course, I don't do too badly, but we're we're always looking for more success, aren't we? Uh, But he also talks about writing cross genre and refusing to be boxed in. And what he had to do as an early writer, he actually ended up buying books off the publisher in order that he wasn't labelled as a horror writer forever. Uh, Also, why he decided to leave his uh, big five publisher and move to Amazon publishing, as well as how he remains so prolific. Although personally, I love a lot of what he said, but I will not be emulating his extreme working hours. (laughs) That's for sure. So you can listen to that on the Writers Inc. podcast on your app. In business, Orna Ross has an article about indie authors and the creator economy, outlining the different ways that authors can make money now. It is just an ever-expanding smorgasbord of options and uh, so much better than it used to be. She includes things that I've talked about, obviously, including subscriptions, thank you patrons, premium products like signed books, courses, affiliate income, advertising and sponsored content, as well as partner programs where sites like YouTube and other social media platforms reward content. In fact, I think TikTok has just uh, announced a new paid paid 
content thing. There's also paid newsletters like Substack, which actually I talked to John about because he has one. Uh, Serial writing like Radish and Vela. Oh, and on Substack, I also have an interview coming up with um, a writer called Elle Griffin, who's using Substack and she's doing lots of interesting things that are quite different. So yeah, more on Substack. And I'm also thinking about it myself around the travel. So yeah, I mean, there's always new options. Other things, serial writing like Radish and Vela, membership sites, crowdfunding with Kickstarter and other sites, selling direct and more. So Orna also goes into tips on how to navigate the creator economy and what attitudes you need to adopt, starting with valuing yourself and your intellectual property, as well as your readers. And one that I'm trying to get better at, which is simplify and delete. What is moving the needle in your author life and business and what should you let go? What is holding you back? And that is a question we can all think about. And it brings me on to uh, a comment on Facebook this week. So obviously I am personally very excited about the expansion of the creator economy. As you would have heard in the last episode 601 around NFTs, I'm looking forward to Web3. I'm looking forward to the next decade, 20 years of whatever the next iteration of the tech world is going to be. Uh, But I think it's really important to understand that writing doesn't have to be the business focused career that I enjoy. And if you sometimes listen to this show and you think, oh, do you know, I just never want to do that. Well, fair enough. And I wanted to uh, quote, uh, so SJ Pajonas, who used to listen to the show, don't know if she does anymore. uh, But SJ posted on Facebook this week. And it was a lovely, smiley, happy photo that she posted. And I have, by the way, I have asked her permission to comment publicly on this. And she said yes. So on her Facebook post, she said, see that smile. That's because I haven't checked my sales in 33 days. At the beginning of 2022, I decided to retire from the business of being an author. I'm still writing and publishing, but I'm no longer spending excessive time, money or energy on the business aspects. I take a little time each quarter to set up paid newsletter ads for my free books and make sure my Amazon ads are still running. And that's it. It's been very freeing. I'm actually happy. (laughs) I'm spending all that free time on reading, watching TV, exercising, living. It took a lot of planning and effort and trial and error to get here. I'm grateful for this decision. So that is brilliant. I was so happy to see that from SJ and I congratulated her on this decision as I know how hard it is to step away from things. Now she might decide in the future to come back into it after she's done other things and thought about other things and uh, she's continuing to write but she's just opting out of spending too much time on business and marketing, which if you don't enjoy, I know can be tough. Now, you can definitely learn to enjoy this. I mean, podcasting, for example. I started when I started podcasting back in the day. I just didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know I would enjoy it like I do now. And I certainly, if you listen to early episodes, I did not have the tone I have with you now, the kind of friendly, open, vulnerable attitude, because I didn't know how to do it early on. I didn't, I grew into confidence in audio, like we grow into confidence with our writing and you grow into confidence with business too and marketing. And so I love this attitude. And in fact, John Kramer and I talk about in this interview, when to let things slide. And this is so hard. I know it's this sunk cost fallacy. I've spent so much time on this already, I can't possibly let it go. But hey, you can. (laughs) The world's not going to (laughs) end. So yes, and uh, it's inevitable that these things happen at stages over a long career. And I definitely this year, I'm really looking at what can I let go in order to let other things in. As ever, you know, I struggle with this because I just love everything. (laughs) Well, no, I don't love everything. There are some things I don't love. Uh, But yes, Anyway, I, it made me think when I read about SJ Pajona so that I've seen plenty of people arrive in the indie scene over the, the years and some of them blaze fast and burn out and others decide it's just not for them. And then there's those of us still trucking. And I think it, I think those of us who are still trucking after many, many years in the author business in general, traditional, traditional publishing too, like Dean Koontz in the interview, is people who find what they enjoy about this and then they focus on that primarily and then the other stuff is necessary but you have to figure out how to make the necessary stuff just part of 
the process. So SJ said there she spends a little time each quarter doing the very basic she needs to do for marketing, which she says are paid newsletter ads for my free books. Of course, I often talk about free books and make sure my Amazon ads are still running. So those those are three things, free or perma-free, paid newsletter ads, that's things like free booksy, um, uh, and Amazon ads. And of course, go to David Gochran's post, which I mentioned earlier on davidgochran.com, links in the show notes, <laughs> and you will uh, find some ideas for that. So thank you, SJ Pajonas, and uh, may you sell many books <laughs> with this new new shift. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. There have been so many wonderful, wonderful things coming out of episode 600. So I'm, I'm actually just not going to read any of them because there were there were just lots. And I've responded to many of you personally and thanked you for your kind words. And uh, I'm glad it helped. I'm glad I can keep you engaged. Well, I hope I can keep you engaged as we head toward episode 700. Many of you sent me where you hope to be uh, in sort of two years time, I guess, with episode 700. And that's keep an eye on the prize (laughs) in 2024, which is kind of crazy. Uh, But yes, uh, back to normal shows now, obviously. So you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or email me joanna at thecreativepen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. And uh, I really appreciate all of that. Also, I'll just uh, remind you that I really love if you post reviews on whichever podcast app you're listening on, because that really helps other people uh, find the show. And I always forget to ask that, but there we go. Right, so today's show is sponsored by Drafter Digital, and I'll play a word from Kevin in a minute. Personally, I still use Drafter Digital to publish to Nook, Library Systems, and more. Also, with my co-writing with Mark Leslie Lefebvre, we use the royalty splitting functionality on Drafter Digital to publish to all all the ebook stores, including Amazon, which is the first time I've done that. And they allow this uh, royalty splitting stuff, which is super cool. I also love the Books to Read tool. So books number two read.com, which allows you to add wide links to your uh, books and just have one link for your social media and stuff. And it's recently been updated to include different kinds of print books, paperback, hardback, large print, as well as direct sales for ebook and audio, which is very cool. So uh, ad coming up from Kevin soon. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing, but my time is sponsored by my wonderful patrons, thanks to new and returning patrons in the last few weeks. And of course, although I announce new patrons, I appreciate those of you who pop in, support the show for a couple of months and drop off. Patreon, if you don't know about it, is it is a sort of um, monthly subscription payment, but equally you can turn it on and off as you like. So uh, some of you have been supporting the show for many many years. Thank you so much. Some of you pop in and out, some of you for bits and bobs. So thank you to everyone. Welcome to new patrons, Anthony Mark Tilt, Kay Robinson Calloway, Cindy Gautier, Karen Strippel and Rebecca Conkle or Conclay, I suppose that could be. Thank you to all the supporters of the show. And if you'd like to join and get the extra monthly Q&A audio and uh, we have some little uh, side chat as well, (laughs) you can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right. Here's a word from Drafter Digital and then we'll get into the interview. Hi, this is Kevin Tomlinson with Drafter Digital bringing you DDD Smart Author Tip number 14. The beauty of formatting. You spend a lot of hard hours writing your book and making it something readers will love. So it's only natural to want to make that book look as professional and polished as possible. We agree. That's why we've built our free layout and formatting tools, which let you upload your book as a Word document or an RTF file so we can auto magically convert it into an ebook. And you can choose from a whole bunch of beautiful layout templates to give it that professional look. Because making you look good is one of the things we're committed to. And darling, you look marvelous. Please don't sue me, Billy Crystal. Draft a digital. We are self-publishing with support. Find more at d2d.tips slash creative pen. That's pen with two N's. Because we're big on the numeral two around here.
John Kramer is the author of A Thousand and One Ways to Market Your Books, as well as other nonfiction titles, and founder of the Billion Book Initiative. Over the past 37 years, he has helped thousands of authors, including me, to sell more books. So welcome, John. Thanks a lot, Joanna. Oh, I'm so excited to talk to you. And you were one of the first people I learned about marketing from back in 2008 when I self-published my first book. But in case people don't know you, tell us a bit more about your writing and publishing background. Well, I can't believe it took you uh, 20 years to find me. <laughs> <laughs> since I've been publishing since 1984 or six, I forget which now. I think it was 1984 when I first started publishing and and writing about publishing and marketing books. So it's been a while. Uh, but people find me when they are ready to do something. And that's what you hope will happen with your book, whichever kind of book you're publishing. You hope that when people are ready to find an entertaining read, they find your novel or they're finding a book for their kids and they find your children's book. You know, your goal is to stay out there long enough that the people that need you or want you or hope to find you uh, actually do find you. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll circle back to that. But just on your own writing journey, like way back in 1984, why did you get into publishing in the first place? What is it about the book industry that you love? Well, I was writing books and I wanted to get them out somehow. And so at first I was just pitching to different uh, publishers, but you know how that goes with a lot of authors. It's like, if you're not well known, the publisher doesn't pay attention to you. So I decided to self-publish and then I found, well, gosh, there's nothing out there about uh, how to get your dang books printed. And back when I started out, we didn't have print on demand. We didn't have Amazon. What we had is uh, book printers that uh, called themselves short run book printers, which meant, gosh, we'll print 10,000 copies for you. When, as a poor, starving artist, you don't want to print more than 500 or 1,000. So I created a directory of book printers. That was one of my first books because I needed it. You know, that's how a lot of us end up writing a book is because we actually need the information. Yeah, that's amazing. So wait, right at the beginning, so you wrote that nonfiction book and self-publishing back then, obviously, was just the print copies. So right. since A Thousand and One Ways to Market Your Book is on its sixth edition, I think. Actually, what? it's on the seventh edition, the real world edition. The real world uh, edition. Oh, OK. Yes. So wait, why did you call it the real world edition? Because I, for the most part, I took out the information about marketing online because the book would have been too big with all of that information. So I, I wrote a book about how to market in the real world, how to work with bookstores, how to get distribution, how to do publicity, how to get on TV or radio, get into magazines, uh, things like that. So I spent a lot of time actually writing about marketing in the real world and i was planning to do um, <clears throat> a follow-up book on marketing online but the world has chased me around like a little <laughs> rabbit or something and i haven't gotten to it yet I, i've done little pieces of it but the reality is online marketing changes so quickly that you sometimes wonder whether or not it's worth writing a book like that and quite honestly, I, I just haven't gotten to it yet. Well, it's interesting you say that because it, it, there are a lot of things that change so fast, but some things stay the same. So what has stayed the same since you wrote that first edition, like in terms of marketing principles or I guess overarching strategies? Well, the, the key thing that you need to still do is connect with people that can help you. Uh, connect with the distributors, the editors, the producers of TV shows, the bloggers, the podcasters, and so on. So the one thing I did include in the real world edition was a step-by-step -step process of how to go about connecting with important people, either offline or online. 
So there is a, a really core principle in the real world edition that also does apply to online marketing in a very, very core way, because your main job is still to connect with the people who already have the audience you want to reach. Well, as an introvert, and I know many of my listeners <laughs> are introverts, do you have any tips for those of us who like do not do phone calls? <laughs> Basically, I recommend that you connect with people through email. That's something that even us shy introverts can do. You start by their social media. You start commenting on what they're writing about, what they're doing. You start to try to make some sort of connection. And then at some point along that line, you actually send out an email to them. And again, as you said, you're an intro, or I don't know if you're an introvert or you're just speaking for all the introverts of the world. No, oh, I definitely uh, am. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel that you are. But uh, the thing is that you have to connect with people more than once. If you send out one email and you say, okay, I did my job of marketing my book, people, the world's going to come and find me and they're going to march and buy my book through some magic process that I don't know. <laughs> And the reality is that that magic process doesn't exist unless you make it happen. So you do have to, and you have to persist. You, you have to try to connect. If you don't connect the first time, you try again. You really have to be a little bit uh, obnoxious. You know, <laughs> say and, 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 for, <laughs> and, and for the introverts in the world, you have to be a whole lot of an obnoxious, more than you're comfortable with to some extent, to connect with the people that you want to connect with. Now, the minute you connect with one person, it's almost like then the magic starts to happen. There is actually some magic that if you connect with one top influencer and they write about your book, chances are that other influencers follow that influencer and they go, Okay, if he's going to interview him on his podcast, I want him on my podcast. And that kind of thing happens, and they start to reach out to you. But you have to get the doors open, and that means you've got to connect with at least uh, several influencers that actually say, yes, I'd love to do something with you. I'd like to have you on my TV show. I'd like to write an article uh, in a magazine and feature your book, whatever it might be. Uh, I'd like to do a podcast, I'll, I'll blog about you, whatever it might be, you know, something like that. And it happens that people will reach out to you. And I mean, I was reminded about you and your books because you advertise on Amazon connecting with my name and my book. At least you show up there. Yes, exactly. Yes. Well, <laughs> well, but it's interesting because because I was going to say to you, so I don't pitch. I like uh, I really over the last 15 years, I have barely pitched anyone. Uh, what I decided to do was go the attraction marketing route, which was build something where people come to me. And that's basically what has happened with this podcast is that people pitch me. So it's kind of the other way around because I really I just hated that whole pitching thing. So I guess that's another op option is the attraction marketing, the content marketing, building a blog or a podcast that bring people to you. Yes. And, and I do follow that very specifically. My bookmarketingbestsellers.com website has probably a thousand articles on it now, trying to attract people to find out about me, things like that. Then they connect with me and so on. Now, I know knew about you for what uh, since 2008, I presume. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow it seems longer than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's the world now. <laughs> so I knew about you. And then for something I was doing, I was doing some research. And so I was looking to see who is advertising on my book page for 1001 Ways to Market Your Books. And I saw your books and I saw you had a book about audio marketing for authors. And uh, I was going, okay, that's something I'm working on right now. And I really, so I reached out to you to interview you. And uh, so your passive marketing worked in that way. But you're not really passive marketing when you're doing advertising on Amazon, which I think almost every author should do, especially an unknown author, because it's one way to get people to notice you. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I should say on that, that I do pay a freelancer to manage my Amazon advertising because (laughs) I'm not so into all the the data stuff myself. (laughs) So yes, I believe, I agree, doing it is very important, but many authors struggle with those skills. So would that be another tip is hire professionals to help you if you can't or don't want to do it yourself? Yes, hire somebody If you don't like doing that particular activity or you don't want to do it or you don't have the time to do it, then hire somebody that can do it. But that costs some money. And for most authors, they have actually more time than money. (laughs) Mm. So, But the neat thing about advertising on something like Amazon or Facebook or Google or wherever you might want to advertise is that most online marketing, you can set a budget, even a small budget, $10 a week or $25 a week, and at least test the market and see if by advertising, you make book sales or you make connections, or in some way, it helps you move along in your goal to become a best-selling author. And you can actually target like you do on, on Amazon, you target the people that are trying to find me or my book. And as a result, they also find your book. And that's a beautiful tie-in. I really like creating relationships, whether it's in that passive way through advertising on Amazon, or it's a more aggressive way where you're trying to reach out to people. A lot of authors, as you say, are introverts. They love nothing better than to sit in their room and write books, and they don't want to. Uh, be spending the time doing the marketing that, quite honestly, needs to be done. In some way, again, you can use your passive way or the attractive model, which works sometimes and sometimes doesn't work. But I think authors have to be a little bit more aggressive than they want to be. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I think just the title of your book, A Thousand and One Ways to Market Your Books, I mean, it demonstrates how many options there are. And I feel like a lot of authors get overwhelmed with all the possibilities uh, of what can be done and, and perhaps what should be done. So how does an author decide what to focus on and, and what to just ignore and to pick a handful of things that they can become good at? Well, the criteria for what you do do to market your book, I can give you some of the criteria. One is you have to be able to afford it. So you're not going to probably hire a plane to fly over a beach and say, buy my book or something like that, because that's expensive. You're probably not going to hire a $10,000 a month publicist. So you have to work within your budget, whatever that is. The second thing, you have to have the time to do it. So if there's something that takes an incredible amount of time, you're probably not going to do it. But there are things you can do that don't take a lot of time, and that's what you would try to do. Now, beyond that, you have to look at, well, what connections do I have? Who do I know? Because that's one criteria. Now, ideally, if you've been writing a book, you've found out about some of the other thought leaders in the area that you're writing about, whether it's a children's book author or a novelist or nonfiction. And and so you reach out to them if you can, but you try to make the connections early. You know, Tim Ferriss, when he did the uh, four hour work week, he started by just connecting with internet marketers because he thought, Internet marketers, they're lazy, so they'd like my book about working four hours a week. And they did. They fell in love with it. He went to a lot of internet marketing conferences, and and he just went up to people and said, how can I help you? So he didn't say, how can you help me? He went in and said, how can I help you? So he'd take people out for drinks or out to dinner, and he'd just talk to them and talk about what he's working. You know, he did in the conversation, he was mainly asking about them and what they were doing and how they were working. But he also would mention what he was doing with his book. By the time he was ready to publish his book, he had a, several hundred internet marketers with big mailing lists ready to talk about his book. And so it became, I mean, it actually started selling so well that the you know major media started going, what is this book? How, why is it selling? 
and they'd reach out to him. He eventually, I think within the, the first couple of weeks of his book being out, he had some major TV shows wanting to interview him. But it started with his online marketing and his connections with a lot of people that had big lists with that they mailed out to. Mm. No, you're right. And I remember that. And Gary Vaynerchuk as well was just coming into um, his first book at that time. And of course, both Tim and Gary are now <laughs> absolutely huge <laughs> in the right. o- online and, space. And, and, and have this. huge audiences and are top influencers on their own. Yeah. And it's interesting. I mean, you said right at the beginning there, it's about also staying out there long enough that people notice what you do or they eventually look for what you do. So well, that's, you know, yeah. that's one reason that I actually say that you should think about marketing. If you love the book you wrote, spend three years marketing it. That doesn't mean you spend full time uh, marketing your book. You go out there and at least one do one thing a day for that book for three years. So you think you think of something you do. You send out an email to somebody. You do a podcast episode, which you talked about it as being one of the passive ways to do things. And I love, you know, right now, that's what I'm writing about. I'm, I'm trying to teach people how to start up their own podca- podcast and how to get noticed through that podcast. Because a lot of authors, you know, I tell them, do a podcast. And they don't. And <laughs> it is, it is hard work. <laughs> and so I wanted, so I'm doing, you know, I'm creating a course through email uh, and I'm sending it out to them through my paid uh, email newsletter on Substack. And what I do is I tell them, here's the first step. Here's what you have to do to set up your podcast. It's not that complicated. And then I'm going to be teaching them how to syndicate that podcast, which you love because it's passive, hmm. you know, Once you create a podcast and you set up the syndication, all you have to do is create more episodes because the syndication will take place automatically. And that's one of the really, really neat things about doing a podcast. You can have a podcast be on like top 20 websites like Apple uh, Podcasts and Google Play and uh, Spotify and so on. You just syndicate them. And boom, every episode you do will, will show up on those platforms. And you don't have to necessarily do the market marketing. People can discover your podcast through their favorite podcast listening uh, tool. And for most people, that's iTunes. But Spotify is making a big, big mm. push. Actually, I think Spotify has overtaken uh, Apple now, Apple Podcasts in quite a few markets. Um, oh, I've wow. certainly, yeah, I've certainly changed my listening to Spotify. And I think it just even more from what you're saying is that what has changed in even the last 18 months is the voice recognition is so good now that SEO for voice is really starting to work. So when I'm interested in a topic, whereas I used to go on Google and search for like an article, now I go on Spotify and I type in a title or something like keywords, and then I find find podcast episodes on that topic. So I'm actually using Spotify as a search engine for audio, which again <laughs> is the discover, but and they also feed in transcripts now. So all of my whole transcripts go in, which is, as you know, is very good for search engine optimization. So right, y- right. you're exactly right. And it's only getting better for audio. Well, and the thing is that Spotify, they they're really uh even now today, still trying to build up their podcast listening audience because they make a lot of money in the advertising versus uh, within the podcast. And and so it's become a major source of income for them. So they're actually trying to grow their podcasting platform. So it's a great time to get in and to syndicate your podcast on iTunes and, and Spotify and other places, because even on Amazon, Audible is looking for more podcasts. Oh, yeah. To them, it's mm. free content. No, there's definitely, I mean, how do you feel about audio versus blogging? I mean, when I first started out and uh, found you, it, it was start a blog. That's the way to get people to discover you. Is it now that the podcast is the new blog or social media is the new blog or it does blogging and articles still have a purpose? They they have a purpose because search engines can still discover you that way. But I think 
for most authors, they'd be better off doing a podcast at this point. Audio is hot. And the neat thing is that with the podcast, you can also do a, a video version of your podcast and put it up on YouTube and uh, Vimeo. And a key source right now is Rumble. Rumble is, is sort of the free speech alternative. But the neat thing is, it's, you know, a lot of people think Rumble, uh, R U M B L E dot com, is just a political platform, but it isn't. The most popular uh, videos on uh, Rumble are about dogs. <laughs> oh, wow. That's just like YouTube, like the beginning days of YouTube. And everyone's like, oh, it's just like funny cat videos. And now right. it's obviously not. <laughs> and the thing is that my, you, I, if I were starting off in video, just plain old video, I'd be, my first choice would be Rumble because it's sort of like YouTube in its beginning days when you could actually get discovered on YouTube. Nowadays, what do they do is something like a million videos a day, mm. uh, new ones or something like that. So it's really competitive. Will people find you? They might. But in the old days, YouTube used to have this wonderful algorithm that if you played off of a popular video that was already on YouTube, they would discover your video as well. And it would be one of the top videos on the sidebar. That's no longer the case on, on YouTube. So often I'll be searching for something on YouTube. I'll find one video, but I'll look at that one and all the other videos are totally unrelated to the video I'm watching. <laughs> They're probably paid ads or something. But I mean, that video thing is what's kind of happening on TikTok is people are doing right. relating videos and responding on videos. But this does bring me to uh, another point. So you meant you said that in the old days, which was classic because you could just mean <laughs> last year at this point. When we, again, when I found you, uh, MySpace was still around, which of course went the, the way of the dough and some people say Facebook's maybe on its way out and but even Instagram people moving to TikTok and like maybe blogs are gone and blah 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 but when do we I mean we just can't keep up with all this stuff it is not practical for authors to just keep like I'm not going anywhere near TikTok just not doing it so and there are some things that don't so I don't blog anymore I'm focused on podcasting so how do we know when to let something go because it's almost like that sunk cost fallacy it's like oh but I've been building my platform here or doing this for a decade it's I just don't want to give it up but when do we know we need to give up one way of marketing and start and find another one well when it's not producing results it's one of the best ways to know if you're not selling books any longer through that particular platform or whatever you're doing nobody's discovering you nobody's emailing you uh, things like that, then you know that, okay, what I'm doing now isn't working. Um, I've been told, I have a lot of friends that are in internet marketing, so I'm pretty in touch with people there. And one of the things they're telling me is that Facebook advertising isn't working anymore. Not like in the old days. Again, uh, there was a time when you could run a Facebook ad and you could sell a thousand of almost anything. It, it, it was like you were reaching out and the Facebook ads were reaching people. But that's not really happening now, not in the same way that it was. I don't see as many ads when I go to visit Facebook as I used to. So I'm not sure quite what Facebook is doing to make money, but I'm sure they're still making money. They're Even in Facebook, they're going more and more towards virtual uh, spaces. Mm. And, and Oculus and things like that. And that will be a new frontier at some point. But I don't think there are very many authors who are selling books by tweeting. Twitter well, used to be a hot platform, but I don't hear about many authors who are actually selling books that way. Yeah, but I, for me, Twitter comes back to what you talked about at the beginning, which was connection. It, uh, most yes. of my author friends are people I met on Twitter. Many of my paid speaking engagements have come from Twitter. I get uh, it just a, a lot uh, because Twitter is my number one social platform. That's what I focused on since 2009 when I joined. And it, so for me, it is that that funnel it's the top of my funnel so, hey if it's still yeah. working uh, then you use it exactly i don't get i don't get any traffic from twitter i check my websites to see how people are coming to it my top referral engine is the search engines mm. my second uh referral 
and probably very close to being equal and, and some days surpassing is Pinterest. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I and, do use and, some Pinterest. Do you use it a lot, Pinterest? Uh, it depends on how you mean a lot. I, I pin probably three times a week. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's But if you know funny. how to pin, if you know what to pin, you can get a lot of traffic through Pinterest. And that's, you know, so I created a course about Pinterest, uh, Real Fast Social Graphics, that I partnered with Daniel Hall on. Most of the content is mine, but Daniel's got all the connections. You know, I talked about connecting with people. Well, I use Daniel for that because he loves doing that part of the promotion. And I love creating the content. So it was a, it's a great partnership. Find a partnership like that for yourself. You know, somebody that loves doing some marketing aspect that you don't like to do. And you do the other part and you guys work together and you make a sale or something like that. I'm doing something now coming up. I have a friend, uh, Rudy Schur. He's a publisher at Square One Publishing. And, uh, but, and he publishes a number of books on writing and marketing. So he, he and I and a few other people are going to partner together to co-op market, market each other, market a book, put together a package, something like that. And I think that's a great idea. I think all authors should be connecting with other authors and doing some sort of co-op marketing where you help each other. Now, so there are quite a lot of sort of newsletter swaps and blog tours and that kind of thing. But coming, to, I want to come to email. Yeah, because, I don't um, think uh, blog hmm. tours work anymore. Oh, I'm glad yeah. you said that. No, I completely no, agree. I, I no, think, <laughs> I think a podcast tour could work. In other words, you connect with uh, five or ten key podcast people who are podcasting in your area. And you do, I would probably approach those podcasters by first saying, I'd like to interview you, which is what I did with you. And then you <laughs> said, well, I want to interview you. Now, it doesn't always happen that they come out right away and say, well, let's interview each other. But once you do an interview with somebody, let's say you interview them, and they had a great time, there's a very good chance that they're going to come back and say, hey, I want to interview you for my podcast. Yes, again, that's about that that connection. But just c coming to email because I signed up for your Substack, and right. I, I feel like one of the principles that I guess we've all often had with marketing is it's better to own your own email list. It's better to control your platform. And what if they change the terms and all this? So, what made you go towards Substack, and what's your email marketing principle at, at the moment? Well, Substack. Dot com s u b s t a c k dot com is a free platform. It doesn't cost anything. You can build up a list of ten thousand people, and they will email for you for free. So it, it's like a no brainer to me because they make their money when you upgrade people to a paid version of your newsletter. So on Substack, I have a free newsletter that goes out to thousands of people. Um, and that's free, you know, and so at least a couple of times a week, I'll send out something free. But then I also upgrade them to the paid version. And in the paid version, that's where I'm teaching people a lot of the inside secrets that take a little bit longer to, to get into. So if you want that inside secrets, if you want my course on how to use Substack to market your books and how to use podcasting to market your books, you, you pay me. You, you sign up for the paid version of the newsletter. It's all run through Substack. The neat thing is that Substack, besides that email capability and the paid version, which is like a membership site, they also offer podcasting. So you can do your podcasting on Substack for free. No charge, and it's up and running, and you can syndicate it. They help you get connected with a number of top platforms. I think they do Apple Podcasts, and uh, I think they do Spotify. I forget right now. I, I, I'm just working on that lesson now. So, But they help you connect with at least five of the top podcasting syndication services, the ones that will help get you the exposure you want. Mm. So Substack... It's all free because they make their money and taking a piece of the action when you upgrade people to 
your paid newsletter. And everybody, I don't care what kind of author you are, whether it's fiction or whatever, there's always an opportunity to upgrade people to a paid version of your newsletter where they get insider tips. I mean, even if you're writing a novel, I guarantee you that if you're writing fiction and you have three or four books in that fiction series, there are people that are going to want to connect with you personally. And you can connect to them in an insider's club on Substack where they pay you, you know, say $30 a year or $5 a month, something like that. And they get special emails from you and they get the opportunity to maybe meet you somewhere or a Zoom session with you or whatever it might be that is an upgrade. You can do this if you're writing memoirs, children's books, it doesn't matter. People do want to make connections with you. The guy that wrote, uh, I think it was Andy Weir. I think that was his name. Yeah, wrote The Martian. Wrote the Martian. Yeah. Hmm. He started started podcasting his book as he was writing it. He got 80,000 people listening to his podcast because he was writing his book and he said, well, I'll just podcast it. I'll read it out as I'm writing it. And he built up such an audience that they said, Andy, you got to write a book. Because at the time he was just podcasting some thoughts and ideas initially. And then he started writing the book and podcasting that. He built up the 80,000 readers They all wanted his book when it was ready to come out. Yeah, he did really well. And a lot of us use Patreon. I use Patreon for which it does email people who support you. And I I put extra audio and things on there. So it's interesting how many of these other options there are. And and I did want to ask you about this because, of course, you have built essentially a a nonfiction business around one key book. And then obviously you have tons of other books and products and courses and things. But I, I wondered if you'd talk about where... What are these multiple streams of income? Because many people think, oh, I just have to make my income from book sales. But that, that's not true, is it? Well, the most successful authors don't make their book, uh, money just from book sales. They're making it by going out and speaking and getting paid for speaking if you're nonfiction. Uh, they're making it, if they're fiction, they're probably selling the rights to their book to make a movie out of, like The Martian or the kids' book series from the British author. Harry Potter has his own theme park, for goodness well, sake. Well, <laughs> I mean, she became a billionaire, not just not from selling books. She would have been a multi-millionaire from selling books. She became a billionaire by selling the rights to the movies. Mm. And there's a lot of that that you can do. Now, for a lot of authors, the best thing you could do is to create some sort of course built around your book. If you're a fiction author, you might, you know, there's a, you know, People that read fiction, almost all of them dream at some point about writing a book themselves. So if nothing else, if you're a fiction author, you could teach people how to publish and become successful with doing a fiction book. You did it. Uh, You could just take them through the steps (laughs) of what you did in terms of marketing your book and go from there. Um, Children's book authors the same way. Almost everybody... Every adult that reads children's books dreams of writing one themselves. And almost everybody has a book inside them of some sort. That's one reason that part of my content that I do on some of my websites has nothing to do with marketing or books in general. It's just a way of attracting people to my website so they can discover, because I believe almost everybody has a book inside them. So the, the world is my audience for uh, how to market a book. Now, obviously, not everybody's going to be interested in that. But at some point, I think a lot of people really do dream of writing a book. And why not capture that as soon as you can? And the thing is that a lot of people have discovered my marketing uh, information through the information that I share on. I have a sort of a hobby website called myincrediblewebsite.com. And I started out that website just to use it as an example when I was doing a course on how to market online and how to create a website. So I created a website. I made videos about it. I called it My Incredible Website. <laughs> and, but over time, 
I loved having it because it's sort of like my hobby website. Everything that doesn't fit into book marketing, I throw on that website. So I have a whole section on how to pray, and I'm writing several books on that uh, topic coming up. I, I share my other hobbies, like I love uh, TV series. So I actually have a whole set of uh, pages on that website about where TV se- series is, are set. You know, are they in Texas? Are they in Missouri? Are they in Michigan? Things like that. It, it just fascinates me how people will create a website, you know, create a TV series They're built around a strange town in, in Washington State or Oregon or whatever. So I started collecting that information. I'm just a, I'm a pack rat. Yeah, well, we're almost out of time, but I do want to ask you about this because if anyone goes to your website, uh, they are absolutely packed. And as you've talked about, you you learn something and you turn it into an article or a course or another email or a, or a right. book or, or even your hobbies. You're turning into other things. I'm the same. I started a second podcast, Books and Travel, because I love walking and travel and that kind of thing. But it, oh, cool. it's like we take something, we learn something and we turn it into something else, like the, the kind of creator thing. So. Right. I, I know, and I've, I'm kind of in awe of your productivity. So how do you manage your time? I feel like, and this is a, also a question about marketing, like one of the things that people say is, well, how do I balance my time? <laughs> so do you have any productivity tips since you are incredibly productive? I am, but that's just because I'm persistent. I'm actually a, you know, ADHD in some way. <laughs> <laughs> I just jump from one thing to another, you know, it's hard for me to stay focused sometimes and end up finishing a book. So, but the key thing is if you're going to do marketing, do at least one thing a day. If you do one thing a day, whether it's send out an email, do a podcast episode, get interviewed by somebody else, over time, that's 365 action items a year. And if any of them are even targeted a little bit towards reaching out to the audience you want to reach out to, you're going to start to get noticed. Most authors give up marketing after about two weeks. (laughs) Yeah. And the thing is, is that you have to do something every day for every book that you wrote and love. Ideally, at some point, you find somebody that's even better at marketing your books than you are. For me, that was Jack Canfield and Mark Victor Hansen. They loved my book, 1001 Ways. Jack actually has a video where he talks about putting my entire book up on the wall, basically the ideas, and then acting on them and taking them down as he acted on those ideas. And so he did five things a day. Basically, most of the time it was being interviewed or something like that or reaching out to people that could interview him. Because, of course, with Chicken Soup for the Soul, you had... It was a wonderful interview subject because all you had to do is tell one of the stories and people would be bawling on the other side of the (laughs) line. I mean, the first time I heard Jack and Mark speak and they told a story from Chicken Soup for the Soul, the first book, I had tears streaming down my face. I mean, I just I just let it out. It was such a moving story and it did make me cry. And that's the magic franchise now. I mean, that franchise is a a juggernaut. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, they've sold over 800,000 books. They're probably close to a million now. And, you know, um, a billion. Uh, I t- did that wrong, didn't I? It, they've actually almost close to 800 million books. And I think they're close to a billion. They're moving up towards a billion. And the thing is that they did what they loved doing. And it was really interesting because they told me we sent it out to like 250 publishers and they all rejected us. And I was going, well, because the publishers believe that short stories don't sell. But what the publishers didn't understand is that was book was backed by 100 professional speakers. And every one of those speakers had a stake in that book being a success. And boy, it wasn't just Jack and Mark marketing that book. It was 100 speakers, professional speakers getting out there and saying, this is an incredible book. You should buy it. Absolutely. Right. Well, we could talk all day, but we're out of time. So where can people find you and your books and courses and everything you do online? At bookmarketingbestsellers.com. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, John. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I hope you found the interview with John interesting today and I love that he is still a learning and creating machine after so long. I mean, since I listened to him in 2008, 2009, I mean, he's still going and certainly things have changed, but some things stay the same for sure. My interview with John, uh, so he interviewed me about audio and podcasting. That will be live by the time this goes out. So if you enjoyed my conversation with him, you might enjoy uh, his interview of me. Check that out too. One correction in the show, uh, John talked about Andy Weir podcasting his book, but I went and had a look because I thought at the time, I think he blogged his book and he did. So Andy Weir blogged The Martian and then his... um, blog readers said please can you turn this into an ebook and he put it up on kin self-published it and then he got picked up for audio and then a movie deal and all that but the principle is the same he put it out in public and it was his readers that drove the demand and led to great success obviously so next monday i'll be talking to c ruth taylor about self-publishing in the caribbean which is a great discussion of how different things are in different places and how you can build a career around your books wherever you are in the world with the extra bonus uh, that ruth has just a gorgeous accent so look forward to that happy writing and i'll see you next time thanks for listening today i hope you found it helpful You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.